Hi everyone, I'm Kumar Singh. I'm a research director with SAP Insider. And as you may know, in the tech brief videos, we interview leading thought leaders and technology experts in the SAP technology ecosystem. And today we have the privilege to have with us Ranjan Bakshi, who is the CEO of Prospecta. And uh, the topic that we are going to discuss with him today is the criticality of the role that data quality plays in supply chain digital transformation. So Ranjan, first of all, thanks a lot for taking time to speak with us on this uh, very, really important topic and share your insights and expertise with our viewers. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kamal. Nice to be here. And uh, yeah, um, very excited to uh, probably uh, you know, go through my experience and definitely uh, uh, how, how we help uh, the various organizations in this initiative. So let's let's uh, jump directly into it and start with the the first question. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we are going to focus on the role of data quality in supply chain digital transformation. So based on your experience, your company has worked with customers and clients across industries. You guys work in in close collaboration with SAP as well. What 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 are the key areas where data quality within supply chain where data quality is really important from a digital transformation perspective. So let's uh, let's start to step back on from a digital transformation, what we are trying to achieve, you know. Uh, what we're trying to achieve is obviously better better automation, better process efficiency. And I think what you what you're seeing is increased collaboration, um, especially with your business partners. When you say business partners, your suppliers and customers. Um, now, where, uh, where data quality plays a very important role is that if you want to uh, run some of these big initiatives on transformation, um, if your core data like your, your spare parts uh, or even your assets uh, in your, especially in, the, in, in heavy asset industries and, and manufacturing, and also your information around your suppliers, uh, if they're not accurate or they're not, uh, or they're not complete, um, it's very hard to enable these uh, transformational projects um, because now you are not um, relying on calling them on a phone or trying to visit them. It is more about uh, pretty much doing it online, pretty much relying on those data and building those intelligence um, uh, based on that where you can make very important decisions. Um, so a lot of the outcomes of these transformation projects are really uh, are based on um, the quality and accuracy of data. Uh, and the second thing is uh, uh, not having a very common ground of uh, uh, standards or collaboration way of doing things also doesn't help these transformation projects because the way you are communicating with the data has to be understood by the other side. So I think that's probably the key reason why data quality now is becoming very important in transformation. Which which makes perfect sense. and. Uh... Uh, I was actually uh, listening to the conversation uh, that you had with John and reading about it in John's article as well. Uh, you brought a very beautiful point that data quality, there shouldn't be a need for business case for data quality because it's foundational to many different things. And most of all, uh, most important of uh, all of that is that it's foundational for digital transformation. So. As, as an enabler, we know technology plays a, a, a really key role in uh, digital transformation initiatives. From a data quality perspective and uh, kind of at the intersection of data quality and supply chain perspective, uh, you have a very established tool in that uh, area, uh, the DIW, the Data Intelligence Workbench. How exactly uh, can tools like that actually help address some of the uh, needs that you mentioned, the digital transformation aspects or nuances that you just mentioned? Okay, just from a tool perspective, what we have tried to, what we have tried to do is, uh, you know, um, is really focus on a few things here. You know, one is, is building more intelligence to show the problems, okay? Uh, and, and not trying to find the problems. Um, so what it does is, uh, it goes and uh, detects uh, things that you would traditionally do manually and go and find these problems. Um, the, th the challenge with data is people don't get up in the morning and say, I want to go and clean my data today. Okay, uh, It is more about when you find a problem, then you go and go and fix the data. That's how normally people react to data problems. 
Um, so we are trying to do that first. Thing. The second thing is, is how do we create a culture within uh, to to empower business users as a self service? Um, you know, you you see, are you seeing how analytics has changed, right? So analytics today is completely not that I need a tech guy to do it. I can have the business build those dashboards themselves. Uh, more tools do it now. Okay. Uh, same thing with data quality. DIW allows you to do that. Business can go and self serve and and build rules around it and do define stuff. And but and, and and not only do that, the last aspect is collaborate on that. So I can now collaborate between my teams, even with external people like my suppliers. I can send information to them and, and collaborate with them uh, to, to fix the data. So yes, yeah, so it's more about uh, identification, you know, having that self-service mechanism of, uh, you know, managing the uh, or, or, or running the tool. And the third is obviously collaboration, and and that all speeds up the whole uh, way of and you and at least you know that you know, how much is you need to fix and how much you need to work towards it, um, you know, before you start these projects. Makes makes perfect sense, and uh, I really liked uh, how you aligned the the aspects of tool with the the business drivers that uh, those aspects address. So. That was a beautiful way to actually explain it. Uh, talking about explaining things beautifully, uh, I think to get into a little bit more depth of the of the way the tool can uh, deliver value or the benefits, I think it will be great if we uh, use a specific example. And uh, yeah, I was I was uh, researching your product, and I see that you have like different use cases across supply chain since we are talking about supply chain. Uh, but I saw one uh, specific use case in the spare uh, parts data management. So if you could actually use that case and help elaborate in terms of what, what are some of the key challenges that our companies face in that specific arena and uh, how a solution like that, this can actually address uh, them, that would be great. Yeah, so spare part is an interesting topic. Uh, um, and it's one of those areas where uh, that there is a lot of efficiencies that can be brought in. Uh, first of all, uh, when you when do you need a spare part? You need a spare part when there is a problem in your uh, there's a breakdown or there you're going up there and doing some maintenance work and you need a part. And often um, you need the part very quickly. Uh, you just can't wait for that. Obviously, that's why we need to fix it. Uh, it's very hard to first of all identify the part in the system because people can um, call a, a part in so many ways. They can call a ball bearing 35 mm. They can call ball be, ball BRG 35 mm. So I can I can name it so many ways. And what happens in that case is you uh, the biggest thing in parts is yes you you have a lot of duplicates. Okay, but the other issue is that because you don't want to you don't want to catalog those parts. You go and start where well, the big problem, the spare part side of thing is we go and what we call is free purchase order text. So we free text fields. So rather than can we just we just write something down and we order that. And and as you order that, you you, you may have that in your A in your inventory, or you're always ad hocly reacting and not planning your parts properly. And that's the business problem. That's everybody knows that that's an issue. Now, how do how do how do we help? Um, we go and we had an organization that worked and they, they decreased their uh, free text by 80%. Then they are now defined catalog and they can now, uh, I'm sure there's massive cost saving there also, they also got there. Uh, and the reason for that is they just did a few things. They, first of all, the tool has, a, a, we built AI ML capability to, to really enrich the part information uh, with standards like um, ISO 8000, and we partner with companies like ECMA, which is uh, which is build those standards. Um, we have content available of a lot of manufacturers' parts, which we bring in um, to already, which we know the part information. So we we use both content and learnings um, to uh, in ML to to build those part information and actually classify them and enrich them and and. And then also identify all those purchase orders, retext, and see okay which one you should catalog. So based on basically in a, in summary, um, we we help them catalog better. We get the part definition right. 
we make sure you can identify them. Uh, and yeah, it, it results in lower inventory and better management. Um, so this is an important example uh, of, of how we have in many businesses helps uh, to optimize or, or build more efficiency around this airport. And, and it's a beautiful example as well. Uh, based on my experience uh, working as a supply chain analyst and in supply chain analytics uh, in my previous life, uh, I know that there is a significant focus uh, from a spare parts management uh, perspective. There is a significant focus on how we can more accurately forecast spare parts. But these are the foundational elements, right? The, the, the beautiful example that you just quoted, right? The, and I was looking at, uh, I think there was there were some numbers uh, and details about this case study that I was reviewing and I saw like 5% improvement in uh, cost in some areas. So those those are kind of, yeah, so those are the kind of, uh, uh, I think, things that need to be highlighted uh, and tied directly to the point that you were making with John that data quality doesn't actually need a business case. The value is immense and you really don't need to create a business case for that because improved data quality touches upon many different aspects, right? So uh, yep. really, really a great example. Uh, I think one more question. Uh, the last question that I want to ask is something that kind of uh, really ties with uh, some of the emerging aspects today and the hype on AI and ML. Uh, based on my understanding, I know that uh, your solution leverages uh, AI and ML algorithms uh, uh, throughout the cycle, the the data enrichment and cleansing cycle, basically the entire data quality management cycle. So, if you could uh, provide some inputs on uh, at a high level, how it uh, what what are some of the approaches, uh, AI and ML based approaches that are being leveraged in the solution, that will be great. Yes, yeah, to start with, I don't know. Um, uh, this is by Gartner. Uh, well, I think by 2022, uh, they expect that 60 percent uh, of the organization will leverage machine learning enable data quality technology suggestions and re and really reduce any manual task for data quality improvement so that's a doctor uh, 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 you know assessment uh, in 2022 which is pretty much next year and we are seeing that too so so obviously let's start with that so so there's a lot of manual activity uh, and repetitive activity uh, what we call happens in um, in data quality and uh, uh, whether you are fig you know, whether you're identifying issues or whether you are enriching data uh, and and there is a lot of learnings that you can uh, enable um, uh, there's enough for any machine learning you need a lot of data yeah, and being a data quality solution we don't have that problem so we have the data uh, we have we have the information that we need to build those models okay uh, and uh, yeah we have different use cases for those models in supply chain um, in other areas where uh, we have started, uh, you know, people don't need to think about a data quality rule or a business rule. So it just happens as you, as you, as we see those behavior and we see those learnings, and we, we, we know that you know, um, if you if that particular value should be X because that's how you you we have made that model to work. So, so yes, I think. Uh, um, you know, one of the classic example um, um, is identifying manufacturer part numbers um, through uh, through ML. And in terms of how you enter a particular part number um, with a hashtag, or some people enter an add rate, some people and some people enter PRT. So, to building those little little nuances and building those models uh, is what we have really worked on, and and we are continuously working and in investing uh, to keep building those models. Great. And uh, yeah, it's it's really uh, great to see actually AI in action. Uh, there's a lot of hype ar around AI and ML these days. A lot of stuff being thrown. There are like solutions that that claim that they are AI driven, uh, whereas there might not be a need. But this is one specific area where uh, I also believe that AI and ML has a, a very significant role to play. Uh, I have seen aspects of it in spend analytic solutions where AI and ML algorithms have been used in to enrich and clean the data. But this this kind of a solution, I think, uh, has a, a I would say a more significant opportunity to leverage these uh, aspects and to your points earlier, make a, the solution more self-service uh, 
and more business friendly or end user friendly. Uh, like you were uh, the example that you quoted, that you do not exactly have to remember a business rule around uh, a specific uh, uh, data element or data point. So, yeah, great example, I think, of applied AI and ML uh, and uh, in a, I would say, industry ready and industry specific uh, solution. So, uh, I am pretty sure our users will find this really insightful. So I think that that brings me towards the end of uh, my questions, Ranjan. Uh, like I was saying earlier, it was really great to have you with us. Really appreciate your time uh, and few minutes that you have spared with us. And hopefully in the future, we would love to have you back and uh, discuss another critical topic in the area of data quality. Yeah, thank you, pleasure. And uh, very nice to be part of this. Thank you, Kamal. Thanks for your time.